Hello and welcome. My name is Elena Maria Viramontes. On behalf of Cornell University's Creative Writing Program and my fellow Creative Writing faculty members, I have the honor of introducing our MFA Poets and Fiction Writers class of 2020. We are taking a diversion from our normal in-person celebratory reading event and invite you virtually to share the array of young and exciting voices in our program. The class of 2020 was one of the bigger and more diverse groups of graduates. These tenacious writers created meaning from the slippery and unpredictable world in which they all found themselves in. In their solitude and mutuality, they succeeded in harnessing the pandemic woes with profound literary faith. Here's to the MFA class of 2020. This is an excerpt from a longer work called The Visitors. I fly back home, burning to accuse someone of something. Yet the instant I see my mother waiting at arrivals, soft, yielding, all her humor shorn away, my suspicions collapse. They fold into a nameless seed, taking up residence in my left kneecap in the form of a persistent limp. It's just a long flight, I say, when mama rubs at my thigh. I push at her hand. People mill around us and mama tries to take the handle of my suitcase. I wrestle it back. We begin to walk to the car and she bumps into me with every step. Why didn't you call me when you landed? She says, I did, I messaged you, I reply. Did I tell you? Naima didn't call, she says. Naima is my khala's daughter. We don't know them well, Meena and I, because they live in Islamabad and we grew up in Karachi. And neither did Manur. Amna said they were upset, so upset that they couldn't even call. Did they call you? Nobody called me, I say. Nobody has my US number. They didn't even ask me for your number, she says. It is cold, dry, and clear. The smell of ozone fills my nostrils. Mama leads me in loops among acres of parked cars. Did you forget where you parked? I ask. No, no, it's right here in section G, she says, peering up at a sign that says X. Tears leak out of the corner of her glasses. Come on, I say. I put my arm around her. She is short and broad and firm. I walk her in the other direction, dragging my suitcase behind us. Mama shrugs me off when we get to the car. She opens the boot for my suitcase. In the front seat, she takes out a tissue to clean her glasses, her mouth burst. Her face is all red and wet. Do you want me to drive? I ask. She shakes her head, a child determined to go through with something difficult. It takes us an hour and a half to get home because she doesn't want to take the ring road out beyond the city at night. One by one, Kant, Gulberg, Model Town slide by, large houses, bright shops, huge billboards. We keep going in the dark for a while. The roads get longer and straighter. We drive by a school with high brick walls all around it, a roundabout with a statue of Kamal Ataturk, palms lit up with blue and green lights, a little grave shrine on the strip of grass between two wide roads, torn green flags flapping. Lahore, its heat and low buildings, its shrinking gardens and crowded roads is opaque to me. We moved here from Karachi when Meena and I were teenagers. I don't know the names of the neighborhood and I have no friends here, but Karachi was no better. There, I knew only our old apartment and our school. Three malls, two parks, one bookstore for old books and another one for school supplies, the homes of a handful of friends. Inside our building, I knew a lot more. The hollowed out stairwells, the roof crisscrossed with pipes and covered with pigeon feathers, the plot out back overrun with beads and plastic bags filled with rain. A tree bombed with pests. Each tile in our balcony, corners knocked out, the rusted grills. The sparrow's nest in the corner of our bedroom window, stuffed between the glass and the plastic jali, and the open beaks of the pin-feathered chicks inside, yellow-edged and gaping. Finally, we reach the metal gate of our house. There's a small white car parked outside, windshield covered with dust except for a section roughly wiped clean in front of the driver's seat. That's my proposed car, Mama says. She's been here every day. The house looks exactly the same as it did when I was there last. Nothing seems to have disturbed it at all. There is a tube light in the entryway and a mass of dried rushes in a yellowing po marble pot. Up ahead is a wooden door leading to the portion where my Nana's tenants live. Two young girls, university students, whose hours and visitors my mother complains about constantly. Behind another locked door are the stairs that lead up to our part of the house. Mama waits until I'm at the top of the stairs before she turns off the lights and follows me, leaning heavily on the banister. 
The drawing room stretches out to the left, the door ajar. Nana is in there with his sister. Both of them hold their hands together in their laps, their fingers identically knobby and brown. Nana comes to me. His shalwar sticks out from under a sweater. A thickly knotted scarf encircles his neck. I'm sorry, he says. I couldn't keep her safe for you. I'm sorry. Nana is my mother's dad. We moved in with him when I was five. Our nani had been long gone by then. He loves my mother with an unhinged mix of possessiveness and contempt. I try to hug him, but I have only ever hugged him sideways with one arm. His shaking cannot be gathered up. Ismit Popo comes up to us and clutches my arm and then my shoulder. She draws my face down to hers and knocks her hard cheek against mine. Come, says Nana, taking her elbow and pulling her back. Come. This has always been their relationship. When she was still living in Pindi, he would pay for bus tickets for her to visit us and then spend the whole time anxiously directing her how to sit, stand, talk, think. Thank you for coming, Mama says, taking both of Ismat Popo's hands into her own. Ismat Popo lays one hand on Mama's cheek. She has been here every day, Mama tells me again, from the cradle of her hand. We all sit down. I don't know what questions to ask or who to ask them. The brain is like a machine, Nana says. It's full of millions of tiny circuits. Any one of them could go off at any time. Imagine if your laptop was broken. Can you fix it? One small misfire. That is what the brain is like. Once it breaks, it's all over. It's a machine. Mama recounts the whole story. She goes through the events step by step. She was waiting for me to get ready, she begins. We were going to go buy shoes. She went downstairs to start the car. And she goes through the whole thing, everything, step by step. Nana sits looking at his own hands, knotted into petrified wood in his lap. Mama stops halfway through her sentence. There is no body to look at, so there is no evidence. Who knows if she even died? Maybe she just disappeared one day. The world pressed her out of itself. For hours and hours, maybe days, we, the four of us, Mama, Nana, Ismat Popo and I sit around. Nana leaks constantly, tears, theories. There is a churning in his soul. His personality is leaking too, becoming unstable. The people who had come to the funeral, their grief is new evidence, unsuspected. I can see that he is changing, reassessing. He is forced to reconsider his judgments on Meena and therefore his judgments on life. What it's for, what makes it good. Meanwhile, Mama's grief is like a river. It pulls everyone in, under. They can't help but be flooded in her presence. Except me, I am a boulder that refuses to give way, wet but unyielding something in me gray and assessing. The doorbell rings while we are sitting there, people coming by for condolences. I go into the kitchen to make tea. Mama comes in to tell me that there's two of them. She shows me the furred white skin on her hands, dried up from scouring pans of cooked chai for all the visitors over the last few days. I open and close cupboards and find the snacks Mama keeps for visitors. I pour stale Nimco into bowls and tear into packs of candy biscuits, putting the broken odds and ends into my own mouth. I recognize the new visitors, two women in embroidered shawls and frosty jewelry, their skin plump with good health. For one week, a few years ago, they came over to our house every other day. They eyed Mina and me, chattering, giggling, surveying our split ends, our frayed cuticles, our horn toes, our pouchy eyes from staying up all night staring at our laptops, asking our opinions about work, clothes, where we would like to go for our honeymoons. Then they disappeared without notice. Now they sit hunched like vultures, their hands in their laps, tracking the emotions on our faces with flat eyes peering out from between their dark feathers. I smile at them through the crumbs in my mouth. One of them lifts a hand towards Mama. Wo bohat achhi thi, she says. She wasn't made for this world, says the other. I turn against the accusation in my mother's gaze, who has divined before I move that I am about to leave and leave the room. I stand by the tall, narrow windows next to the balcony door, working my tongue around the sweet glue in my mouth. It is getting dark. A sheer navy curtain has dropped over the world outside. On the balcony of the house opposite, a woman sits on a charpai, looking at me. She has a brown cumble huddled over her lap. A thick shawl covers her shoulders, a wool cap perched on her gray head. She looks away from me and toward the sky. A shadow passes over her face, and for an instant, she is wearing a death mask. Then the dark blob resolves itself into a pair of binoculars. She peers into her neighbor's garden, then sweeps the binoculars over our house, swings them over the sky and looks into the garden of her neighbor on the other side. Why hadn't I broken the bones of this world and rearranged it so it could have been made for her?
I'm going to read three poems. Bath Theory. I wake up in a country of bath theory. There's several of them. Gargles sputters of bath theory. Spit out hallowed commandments of bath theory. Nuance complexify. Charter rational air to wilting wounds. This is a profound humanist gesture. Bread slides from oven, crackling about the gestation of bath theory. Birds clamp down from electric lines, amnesiac, throttled by recitations in bath theory, yelping sweet, nimble cumuline. On my sun chair, sitting stiffly to reduce contact with vestments cut from the same cloth as bath theory, I hold curls of plaster in expectation of bad theory's wrath. I dance in the absences shed by bad theory, pour unsanctioned water into the mouths of our premises. Bad theory berates me, says, this house, founded on bones rummaged up by bad theory, is sturdy and justified. I fumble to bed, tongue a mouthful of lesson in not, not subverting my bad theory. In dreams reflux, defiant mumbles, once self-canceled and now percolating in dirty deltas of my liver. My health yoked to glutinous tolerance of you. One memory certainly hides another. That being what memory is all about. One hawker may hide another hawker. One keychain hides another one. One napkin may hide a father's crumpled mouth. One mouse may hide the laughter of a small child. One daughter may hide another daughter who hides the first daughter after all. So one finds hurled toward them at a furious speed the words ones hurled towards their own mother. One ticket may hide another ticket, one departure, an unseemly one. First you watch long shadows stagger off trees by the window, traveling in reverse. Then you are at the start of day with the shadows clasped around you. One country may hide another country. One history hides another. One skirk is an invitation to the dead. One hunk may hide the contrivance of a rain shower pattering against the frown of orange shingles and falling down, down, where one hunger hides another. One raindrop may hide a slant of light. One house may hide another gangling house until from far above you see they form a human chain. Humidity hides a once present language. Your lexicon's a melted alloy around the word love. So it's better not to stray too far from your original flame. One simile hides another simile and let syntax hide the fear of your reflection on the convex mirror of a spoon. One chartreuse hides another chartreuse, one erratic flight one chance encounter, one draft. Platonic forms hide the hiding. One lyric may hide nothingness, as when you arrive at the end of a line and there's little more assimilable weight. One memory certainly hides another, one life, another life. Look, look, you're no longer living in it after Kenneth Koch. And the last poem is a small section from a longer poem that I'm currently working on. Father's Mother, you in 1943, for your nation only a ghost, Send to a boarding house across the northern border when I was seven and looked to you as I looked to the seasons brewing caprices outdoors 
and mother stripping, then dressing me up with providence vested in her by her own helpless child, I was more prone. The years you lived in exile, a new and minor tongue. So speak memory, but cannot draw on paper to shape, shift, or re-manifest to boast your richness or bonsai. For you bear low distinction in the bruise marks, a pound of flesh, bear low remuneration to cloth or gold to cast in pains and call it spoils. For you cultivate no special sentiments, whatever happened, happened, and life procreates on the ransacked ruins you could have called house but didn't. You for your nation only a ghost. And when you came back, nothing had ended, and nothing ever does when you come back. Tell me the story of your grandmother's low life. I hate anthropology and the storytelling text. Her bones are commoners, her mind is stayed. Two children, grown in the 20th century, amniotic sack, bombed and intoxicating. So in young boys grow men with fashionably late neuroses. The invisible father, the irascible one, surging intermittent sweetness. Their touchless hands proximate to love's feathers. She says she's not responsible, is a consequence of the draft. Their smile slew in a confounding direction in the splotchy Kodak, which conveys no deaf perception, as nostalgia does not either. So this is what father's mother chooses to remember, answers to the cold solicitations of night's half-forgetfulness, while light long arms in a boxing match and skirts on curvatures which delimit my sensors too. Even the grand dame shelled peanuts. Days gone. Miserable, and we, I, leave it at that. So when I search for stories that could set your suffering in some world historical light and find pervading the room's interior, half light, find us as two logs bark shriveled and hardly shed parallel to each other on the same mud bed, find pithy remarks. Days. Gone, miserable, and the grand dame shelled peanuts. Yes, or is it my flaw to stop short of prodding? A stone tentative and imbalanced in my throat, your tongue wedged against a front tooth clamoring. It's turtled round like a control stick and emits Moist sounds. Thank you for listening. The following is an excerpt from what my novel has grown into over the last four years. Invisible Creatures. Sarah Sanchez fell in love with Helen Garrison when they were in the fourth grade, and of all the girls in Mrs. De Palma's class, Helen spent recess with her. Sarah doesn't call it love, she calls it being Helen's best friend. But love is what it is, and nothing is going to change that. Not Helen's two months summer vacation at Martha's Vineyard, where she's been fielding propositions from every country club boy in the neighborhood. Not the excessive BFFs Sarah's doodled on the letter she sent every week in the meantime. And not this consolation prize girl's trip to Galveston. Sarah is in love, and one of these days, it's probably going to kill her. It is July, and the sun is punishingly high and clear. 
Sarah is burning up like a rotisserie chicken at the supermarket, wet and crispy at once, with sweat so deep through her clothes the pleather under her thighs is slick. Her vision stings at the edges in a way that makes the landscape blur and flare with light, impressionistic and exhausted. Sarah leans her head against the seat in front of her and finds a new spot on the window to focus on so she doesn't get motion sick as they rattle past sun-bleached bodegas to get to the stop. They're all a wobbly blur to her, but if she focuses on the brine stuck to the window or the screws holding the frame together, she can find something that reminds her of Helen's sticker manicures, her glitter eyeshadow, the freckles she tries to hide. If Sarah tries hard enough, she can find Helen anywhere, even in a speck of salt spray. There is more than one Helen Garrison, of course. Like any beautiful girl, Helen is in high demand. But unlike the Ashleys and the Jennies who flock around her, Helen has more than just home and campus versions. Helen has commodified herself into a whole special edition series, one for every occasion. There's Homecoming Helen, Shopping Helen, Party Girl Helen, A minus in everything Helen, because Helen knows how to achieve without scaring away the boys, each with their own matching lipsticks, shoes, hair ties, and smiles. Everyone wants a Helen, and most of the time, everyone gets their wish. But there is also the real Helen, Sarah's Helen, a one-of-a-kind secret she would sooner die for than speak of. Sarah's Helen wakes up with gumpy hair that smells like sugar and chemicals from all the products she uses. She has a galaxy of freckles around her nose and down her shoulders, and cackles like a witch when something surprises her. Her large eyes are slanted strange, upward toward her nose like a cartoon fairy, and little dimples mark the swell of her thighs. She wears ugly t-shirts to bed and can never decide what she wants to watch when she finally has time to catch up on everything she's recorded. When she smiles... Her face breaks in two, and she looks ravenous, one bite away from eating the world like a piece of cake. The bus pulls to a stop, the brakes screech, the engine rumbles, and the quiet travelers turn anxious, rising to their feet, stretching and checking watches. Sarah wiggles out the door, and around to where luggage spills out the side. She tries to shoulder her duffel bag in one go, like she's seen sporty girls do on TV. But Sarah is not strong, and the effort tips her over. She's about to crash when two perfect hands catch her by the shirt and pull. Sarah stumbles forward now and crashes into the arms of... Helen? Miss me, loser. Helen's pink lips are five inches from Sarah's eyes. She's never seen this color on her before. It's got the tiniest flecks of glitter in it and curves under the thin line where Sarah knows her lips really end. Up this close, it's like she's wearing melted cherry sours and their guts are dribbling down her mouth. To anyone else, the shape of her lip is just a little fuller. It's a trick, a mask to keep people she doesn't really care about from getting too close. Sarah imagines herself sucking off that extra curve of lipstick. As a joke, obviously, because Helen doesn't need to hide, and it's funny, the stupid things girls do to put on a show, right? And maybe Helen would laugh, maybe she would smile, maybe she would... Hello? Sarah shakes off her momentary insanity and slumps into Helen's arms, laughing. Uh, duh, I always miss you. I've read 20 books in the last two months and written a hundred pages of garbage, and somehow I'm still behind on my thesis. I'm the worst kind of nerd. You know, those words are banned from our trip. No college, no thesis, no homework, no nerd stuff. What else? No boys? Helen rolls her eyes and sags against Sarah, zombie style. Don't even remind me. It was so boring, I almost threw myself out the window twice. You did not. But if Helen hears her, she pretends not to. She pets Sarah's hair and gestures for her to follow, rambling about her trip all the while. As it turns out, she only spent the first week with her mom. The rest of the time, she and everyone were with Edward Graham at a summer house. Sarah vaguely remembers Edward from Candy Colored Girls magazines. Some guy who showed up at the Teen Choice Awards as a pop star's date and then starred in a Cadillac commercial three months later, even though he sounded like he had applesauce in his mouth. His parents are cool. 
Helen said. They let everyone take over the den to play Silent Hill and Mario something and have drinks by the poolside and go to the lake and play Jenga with the set so huge. Edward used it to climb onto the lower roof one night. It crashed underneath him, but he made it. Such a dumbass, Helen says, shaking her head in a way that makes Sarah wonder if she really means the opposite. But just then, I literally looked over my shoulder to hear what you would say about it. But you weren't there. It was just the same old crew and... (sighs) Helen frowns into the horizon. Sarah doesn't know who the crew is meant to be. The practically and practically family means she's not invited to Martha's Vineyard. But none of this matters next to Helen's sad face in the sunlight. That just makes it even better that we're together now, she says, pulling on her hand. They link up most places they go and how for so many years that the gesture has almost lost its magic. But right now, right now with Galveston blasted orange and yellow and gold, the sky bluer than a postcard picture and Helen's hair blowing behind her in the hot breeze, Sarah is glad of it all over again. Nothing else matters. I'm sorry I made you talk about it. Tell me about your trip here instead, or what you want to do tomorrow. I know we said no nerdy things, but Anne Rice is giving a reading this week, and there's a cocktail hour before, so I was thinking it might be fun to... Oh, slow down there, cowgirl. I have a much better surprise for you first. Better than meeting Anne Rice in person? Helen points in front of them. I don't know. Do you think riding in that convertible for the rest of summer sounds better? Sarah scans the lot, a few beach batter sedans, a mini fleet of monster trucks, and a vintage convertible that looks like the blown-up version of a Happy Meal toy. Glossy, absurd, so pink she doubts her grip on reality the more she stares at it. Helen dangles a key to the Cadillac next to her ear so they sing. Surprise! Sarah sputters for words. She isn't a car girl. When she hitches a ride, she only cares about how good the AC is and if she'll have to pull some lever to climb into the back and risk flashing the front seat. She has no idea what to make of this beyond, Helen must have gotten a pretty girl power upgrade while she was gone. This is definitely not from your mom. Does she even know? Kind of. I don't think she can do anything about it besides throw a fit, and honestly, that might be fun for old time's sake. Now, what are you waiting for? I want to be seen. Let's go. Sarah slides into the front seat with her backpack clutched to her chest. She does not want to be seen. When she had imagined this vacation, they were singing at the top of their lungs in the box safety of Helen's old car, sprawling on a bed inside the rental house, doors locked and windows open just enough to watch the stars, maybe climbing out on the roof or the beach at midnight, where no one would think to look for two girls just inching out of their teens. What is she supposed to do in a car so nice people stop to look at it? Or where guys might see them in honk asking for a wave and a smile and maybe to pull over for beers. And Sarah doesn't want any of them looking at Helen, not with her. She wants to sail on you Helen's to end so she can keep hers all to herself for the first time all summer. The whole time Helen was away, Sarah hadn't called, hadn't sent more than one letter a week. She had been good. But what if the only time they got to be their real, ordinary selves was... Relax, (laughs) Helen says, smirking like she's heard everything in Sarah's head. Buckle up and just have fun with me, okay? And she flashes that smile, the one only Sarah gets to see... And how is she supposed to answer that with anything but yes? Thank you. Mid-air. A rhino is flown to her sanctuary. Her pastime is mud wallows, her passport a blank book unstamped. Upside down, strapped, she looms as large as the helicopter from which she hangs. A sleep dart 
like a coffin's crank, has lowered the air into the dead space of her lungs. Watch her crescent horns, were it not for the slackless blindfold, she'd upside die, panicked if she woke. When she comes to, she will know her body is an aircraft that teleports her. Only a fly flew with her in her ear. She took no satchel, no soil in full bundle. I get her, rhinoceros in her sanctuary, no one hunts. But haunted, her horns ache. They're bent on spinning out to return, right side up on her land. Mother Mollusk. They deported my mother back to me. In Punto Fijo, hidden in virgin sands, abalone, my seashell curled in a shack. She dreamt the tide, smuggled her to Florida that a current cold harbored her to my father in New York. Mother of pearl, mother of tea reed pearls, you took off your home and were bullied by bigger girls in Bogota's jail. From the top bunk, you watched acrylic nails pick at pineapple platters in an Aruban cell. My caracol, a spot on slug, slobbering, a bull god officer sniffed her passport and chewed it up. Now who will glue her face back? Her sockets gray stumps, her lip line fleeing with her lips. She's a babosa in a tantrum, my mother of nails chip. Now pinned, upholstered to the couch of her mother unshaved, she tugs at her own skirt. I want to rub her shin bones, they shine naker. But she's in her feelings, I don't touch her felt. Mother swayed. I don't run to you, I don't sit on you, I stay in the corner of your eye, I'm the only tear that doesn't roll down. Mammalian Longing I land in 2003 and my father picks me up, no, he bends to his knees and my escort disappears. The snowstorm enters Jonefe Airport and takes the rest in a flurry. Not even my mother is there, though she insists, my father and I swear. It is only my father and I, his red hot ears in the plumpness of our coats his north face and the one he cloaks. Over my leather, I am his cub, I am his deer, his piglet and he, all babas and he. Bites, hoof, poof marks into my cheek. This is the most we've been in love since. Buckle up. Out of a patched up suitcase, my father sold clothes. Colombian jeans, Colombian girdles, Chinese blouses in beauty salons where women, Doña Florinda's coiled in rolos, knew my name. How long he'd waited for us how much he'd worked. 
Now, together, after school, we sold clothes. Out of a wheezing suitcase, he dragged through Roosevelt's snow, the whole avenue, mud. One day, we make two hundred dollars. Proud and counting, we get inside his car and warm me counting a block down. The cops stop us, our blue car bats its Batmobile lights, and it is a female cop who asks for my seatbelt. A ticket, two hundred dollars or plus. She says, because we could have crashed and I could have got hurt so bad. Daddy, seatbelt of my life, you strapped your arm around my shoulder as frowning, I buckled up. Lift. In San Pacho, my mother holds my hand. They shoot a man. We're walking from our grocery, La Familiar, when this man, a fledging baby bird stuffed with lead, fumbles in flight towards us. His wing mouth widens. He dawns on us, we pale transparent. See through as the air he launches for and falls. At my feet, my mother picks me from the ground. She shuddered. This story is a snap shot from her mind. When she tells it, as though not to me, she asks. I always wonder if she remembers. Watch. My memories spring forth like a pebble from a slingshot. Perhaps I gasped. For sure I inhaled and lived that breathless sight. This is an excerpt from my short story, Showman. My dad's first boyfriend was named Christy, though no one called him that but my dad, who didn't call Christy his boyfriend. My friend Christy is coming to King Kong with us, is what he said, reading his phone after we descended into Roslyn Metro Station. Who's Christy, I asked. My friend. It had been two years since my dad relapsed, a year and 11 months since he came out, and my older sister, Manu, had just received her license. Previously, seeing her dad had required he or my mom drive a five to six hour road trip or to negotiate the exchange, usually made at a certain Sheets gas station along US 29, halfway between Charlottesville and DC. There were several Sheets gas stations along US 29, between Charlottesville and DC, and this had resulted in at least two fights. They all looked the same, my dad had said twice. This was our first solo trip, taking away some of the anxiety. As our dad was still living at his sister's condo, everyone knew their place. I stayed on the couch in the basement outside my dad's room, while my little sisters shared the one on the second floor. Manu moved around based on space and mood and need, sometimes with my sisters or on an air mattress next to me, or with her aunt Ceci, who said she wasn't coming to the movies. Nothing at first seems especially odd about the addition of Christy. My dad had a habit of surprising my sisters and me with last minute changes of plan, additional guests, usually colleagues in some capacity, and female. He liked showing us off when we were in town, and because he could sense we disliked it, had started telling us right before doing so, or not at all. We'd pull up to a private home instead of a restaurant, or he'd ask the host if anyone in the Martinez party of eight had arrived. As he'd recently started a new job at a pediatric hospice center, I should have expected it. Is that okay? He said to Manu when the orange line arrived. She had become the de facto caretaker of these visits, coordinating the dates, arranging transport, Ensuring the mood stayed positive. This meant she generally guided conversation too, but after saying, yeah, of course, we all fell into silence, hurtling toward DC proper. She chewed the inside of her cheek as my dad and I watched Ani and Issa try to hold their balance on the rocking floor. 
Where are we meeting Christy? My mono asked after five stops, pausing almost imperceptibly before the name and not the pronoun. Downtown at the theater, my dad said, and Manu nodded. She hadn't gotten the answer to the question she was really asking. Is Christy a guy? I asked with dawning horror at where this bullet was headed. He's a Romanian, my dad replied, looking out the window at the blur of black steel. Do you work with him? I don't. What do you guys think for dinner after? Is he coming to that too? Manu and I caught eyes and she flared hers in warning. That morning, she had asked me not to be rude or to pick a fight, so I stared at the caution stickers above my dad, which showed cartoon figures facing the consequences of ill-advised behaviors, their pain expressed in zigzagged red lines. How did you meet him? I said. My sister dug her thumb into the small of my back, but I was wearing a thick fleece so it didn't hurt. Dad? He didn't say anything, having a habit also of pretending he hadn't heard questions he didn't want to answer. My ears rang with the shrieks of the subway. How did you meet Christy? I asked again, louder, more insistent. Manu hooked into my side, doubling me over as the train breached at Foggy Bottom Station. The doors opened and my dad exited first. Christy was waiting outside the theater, and when he waved, caught a flash of pale, thin wrist. Smaller and older than I'd imagined, still younger than my dad by several years, he looked cold, rocking back and forth with his hands underneath his armpits, and nervous, nodding subtly, repeatedly, already agreeing with anything we might say. His brown leather jacket had a beige stripe, his jeans sagged, and his sneakers, once white, were scuffed and double-knotted. Hello, my dad yelled too far out and he had to hold his smile, straining for several seconds as he ran ahead to meet Christy. They moved haltingly with each other, false starting and stutter stepping into an eventual hug. My dad banged him on the back and bellowed hello for a second time. Manu wouldn't trade looks with me. Meet my kids, my dad said with the chummy bombast of a showman. My sisters and I introduced ourselves in order, like Von Trapps, and Christy gave us each a nod and a handshake. Hello, he said, swallowing the L's as an accent surfaced. I'm Chris. In the theater, Chris and I sat farthest apart, my dad corralling him first into the row, me stepping to the side to let my sisters in next. I was scared what I might see if I were too close, but once seated, I worried what I was missing. I couldn't hear what they mumbled during the trailers, what made my dad pretend to laugh. Chris didn't seem like someone who told jokes. In the 10 minutes we'd been in line for popcorn, he had spoken only when asked something directly, his answers mostly monosyllabic and given in whisper to my dad. Where do you live, Chris? Mono had asked. Near here, he'd said blushing and vague as if it were an intensely personal question. Manu sat beside her dad, Ani and Issa between us, so I couldn't ask her if Chris was the reason Ceci had decided not to come. We went to a lot of movies when we visited, often inappropriate for seven-year-old Issa. Munich and War of Worlds, Cinderella Man and Memoirs of a Geisha and Not Brokeback Mountain. Our aunt almost always came with us. As the trailers rolled, I tried unsuccessfully to imagine Ceci meeting Chris. My dad had been talking about moving out a lot lately, and though he'd done so for as long as he'd lived in Ceci's basement, it sounded more urgent this time, less like a maybe one day wish. I was sure Chris had been over to the house, could picture him with my dad in the basement, the two of them scooting toward each other on the couch I slept on, linking pinkies like middle schoolers. But I was sure she hadn't met him, sneaking in late at night or when she was out of town for work. The basement didn't have a separate entrance, but there was a window next to the stairs that looked onto a concrete dugout beside uh, the front stairs. He said climbed through it once when we were locked out and Chris would fit. The movie was three hours and 21 minutes long, most of which I spent finding reasons to lean forward, reaching over for popcorn or drink or to check if they were holding hands or resting them on each other's legs. I went to the bathroom four times as I had a better angle on return, using the light from the screen to discern movements uh, between the seats. I saw nothing. Kong died in Midtown and we exited the theater tired and sad. Chris said he knew a good Chinese place nearby, and my dad told us it was amazing. So earnestly in defense of the stranger's choice of restaurant, I might have blushed were it warmer. We walked three pair on the sidewalk, Manu and I in front. It was cold and windy, and at that age, 14, I never wore coats, only jackets, so I hugged myself against the blusters slicing through my fleece. Chris's dad's boyfriend, right? I said. She shrugged in a way that meant yes, and like her shoulders weighed an incredible amount. Do you think Ani and Issa know? I don't think so, she said, though I disagreed. Don't tell mom. At dinner, our dad carried the conversation, asking the questions, then prompting the response or answering himself. Lenito, tell Christy about cross country. He runs too. Chris confirmed that he did, in fact, run, and we moved on to other questions that he answered in single words. Did he come to this restaurant a lot? Yes. 
What was the best thing on the menu? Dumplings. Would he share Szechuan green beans? Sure. Did he like the movie? Yes. And when he hazarded an opinion that the dinosaur fight was super cool, we all enthusiastically agreed, the energy of the table rising several inches as if we were watching a baby or stroke victim form his first words. At the end of the night, by the entrance to the metro station, I shook Chris's hand and my sisters hugged him goodbye. My dad told us to go ahead to the platform, Manu, Manu leading Ani and Isa to the long escalator as I wondered what my dad wouldn't want us there for. At the last moment, I took the stairs. What are you doing, Manu said, but they were already sinking down the incline. Orange light echoed out from the tunnel and after six steps, heart knocking around my rib cage, I turned to tie my shoe. First, I had to untie it and as I felt along the knot, fingered the divots until they loosened, I looked over the top lip and scanned for familiar legs. There, the hem of Chris's thin jeans flapped between the corduroy pants of my father, seat pressed flat and faded below a cabled sweater my mom had knit him. Their feet were interlocked like zipper teeth, my dad holding Chris's face, his own crunched upward in grin, lips wet, they kissed. It was quick, nothing much, but my stomach sank so low I thought I might tumble backward. Instead, I sprinted down the stairs, foot over foot over foot, waiting for a slip on worn concrete to throw me head over heels and break me on bitter impact. I'm going to begin with an epigraph from Sandra Lim's poem, Small Container, Fury. Let the world eat me, but then let the world sob, not me. A stroke of dirt. When dad passed, a butterfly clapped its wings and that's the sound dearest to silence a soul nearness, leaving prepared me nest of nothing. I am next to nothing. Mom said at his funeral, I cried and asked, Where's dad? Where's dad? I remember nothing of those months. Only after the fleshy feeling of a hole in me. When thinking of him, an ache stemmed my chin to chest. I fell into myself. Thought I must be something wrong to be so alone. I dug backyard, aged into the soil, horizon by horizon, expecting parent rock. I pulled out a whole girl, a whole and then myself. And so it was. My mother said, if your father were still alive, he would have a fit. You know that, don't you? he would have a fit. Spared him. I am she who stalks tall as grass beneath the branch working swallow. I was born out of tongue and only the dirt would have me. I am a loam. I am a loan. I am the lunacy of living furled below Lois, sediment, error, anti-sentiment. Here is wind. Live, have your fit, blood clot, kill me. Near dead, I am daughter blipped, yellow elsewhere bleak. A facey faced whole-hearted, deciduous blank. 
where all we flowers. Where all with flowers, your first bloody lips, in grass from garden, backyard, toy, chest, ours, the thing is wrath, epitaph, sepulchral thirst, look, Chesapeake, look, Lord, Baltimore, Ma, her Sunday word slammed closed inside you, you, the girl who doesn't get barrettes. No bowl of braids heads down the stairs. Ma is a long well away. Night air, flotsam, winter. Granny, mama, see, sees you. She lingers in light, saint-like above, up. Let's your legs toddle alone, travel steps abalonously. You are slipping already out of Mother Harbor. Baby blue, your body whirl, struck by every knuckle. Ma, 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 no daughter of pearl. Redacted daughter, redacted daughter, redacted daughter, redacted daughter. Forgive the first thing about me, detachment, a cavity called chest. Before milk, there was gravity, the small thud of singular blood. Drown is out, the self sounds a heart makes, flooding herself with herself. Medicalized murmur, whisk per pitch, Nub of nothing pinched. Boy, oh boy, you a chorusing still. Forget the first thing about me. I am not the shell of you divided by his seed. If I was born anything, it is distance, immeasurable, in the plane of looking. I am expelled at first glance, struck where you were cut. There is a nurse overseeing epidural, my one heart arrested by fault, already dead inside you. Buzz, buck, pulse, shock of emerging C-section. Every day this dying too. Unname your wound, when will you hear me out? I was not born unto kingdom, but sliced from fluid forgiveness. Embryonic years and years, my knees flung wide for the world's concision. Holly bells of you ringing under my skin. Away from you I stand orthoscopic in a full grown body under amniotic waters, stilling me, my name, the many days I have peeled and purpled, climbed the vines, spreading like a rumor all along, a tower fleshed moment, splitting vision, your many voices arriving, sirens, find me, falsely accused of exiting, wrongly, your womb, a king above the inverted cunt, you call me, cuts sonographically through the zero matter of what I choose, nothing, never, fist pounding my belly, night, terror, mother, I am trying so very hard not to hate you. Not a suicide note. I have hidden the knives and safety razors inside a bag, inside a box, inside a bag, under my bed, enclosures bare at the bark of my blood. Disclosures keep these gallons in case the tree clovers have not yet called I am urgency. The measure of my hands from a blade, my feet from the lake, my brains from the bathroom sink. Listen, I will not list my passwords and apologies. 
I will not tell you to bury me where the dirt can eat me, nor to shoot me into the nearest stellar nursery. I will not tell you of the gutter rot my mother has called me, nor the porcelain where my father's hands have sent her front teeth. I am not from here, after all, and was born like infants, unsuccessfully murdered into the wrong in this world and learned the salvation of dirt and sewers, something like resuscitation. To have been sent here, I must be the angel of something, shoving away blades and giving them skins. To live beneath my dreams, I must be the angel of something. Sing the stars, sings the warm dark in my knees. Infant goddess, little universe sun, where blooms the common factor of my breaths. Jasmines grow in threes. I am, I am, I am. Certificate of Live Birth. You arrive on a Friday with hail and vast, moving gray above small window of white light as a wound, which might be a passing through of particulate, ultraviolet, waiting to arrive in sight our adjectival C. Will it be violent, our photographic ring around the light? We inviolate what we can't see, revelate its arrival with our question, boy or girl, please let the unseen speak in me. There are stellar nurseries we cannot grimace. I am a certificate of a bright somewhere. You are a poem passing through the membranes I have moved. Mountainous you, head up of the interrogative blue. I'm going to read a short story called Generalized Barotrauma on a 15th Birthday, which was a finalist in the 2019 Narrative 30 Below contest and appeared in Narrative as a story of the week. Generalized Barotrauma on a 15th Birthday. At five o'clock on her 15th birthday, Sarah's on the couch with her cat, feeling loneliness lap like pool water from her chin to her lower lip, when her ex-best friend texts to ask if she wants to see a movie. For a second, the universe shrugs into a counterfactual, and it isn't true that Judy hasn't wanted to hang out since sixth grade when it became apparent to both of them that Sarah's adolescence would be clumsy and sexless, and that Judy, petite and alpha and with a younger sister's foreknowledge of how to go about being a hot girl, could do better. She did do better, Sarah can tell from Facebook and Instagram, where Judy sits slouched on the floor in a tight black miniskirt, holding a solo cup, smiling her vodka tonic and popularity. The relief of this counterfactual is sharp, staccato. Sarah starts to text back yes, there's literally nothing she'd like more when she freezes. She cannot admit to having no plans on her birthday. Little would appall Judy more than Sarah's being unable to scrounge together a few friends with whom to eat cake. Suddenly Judy's text seems less an overture than a test. Sarah remembers sitting in Judy's room in fifth grade, the floor covered in bags of outgrown toys for Goodwill or the garbage, Judy holding up a stuffed sea lion asking Sarah, do you want this? And Sarah wanting the sea lion very much, 
It's always been a fixture of Judy's room, but there's a hidden razor in the softness of Judy's voice, and Sarah hazards a no, she doesn't. When Judy says, good choice, Sarah, she seems pleased but still skeptical, like she knows Sarah has said the opposite of what she wants, which is good but not as good as wanting the right thing in the first place. Judy was always testing her. The morning after a sleepover, do you want one muffin or two for breakfast? When Sarah asks how many Judy's having, Judy demurs, Sarah must decide on her own. So Sarah says one, not wanting to be greedy, and when she finishes hers, she's still hungry and watches Judy begin her second. From the darkness of her room at night, Judy in her bed, Sarah on the floor, who would you rather, Theo or Lucas? When Sarah says Theo, she is sure Judy knows she is only guessing, only simulating desire in order to please. Theo and Lucas mean nothing to Sarah, and distinguishing between them is like determining which word sounds prettier in a language in an alphabet she has never heard spoken. Irritably, one afternoon when everything Sarah says seems to needle Judy, do you want to go to the zoo or Sephora? Sarah picks the zoo, they go to Sephora. It's the last time Sarah has seen Judy. Sarah knows that the right answer now is that she's busy tonight, but would love to see a movie next weekend. She, all, she knows also that Judy's offer stands only tonight. She wants a way to hedge to say, yes, there's a movie length gap in my other, otherwise packed evening, and yes, weird, it aligns precisely with the movie showing you have in mind. She doesn't know what to do with the fact that Judy's text doesn't acknowledge her birthday, when this is the first time she's heard from Judy in months, and when Judy must know what day it is. Sarah knows Judy's birthday as well as her own. They slept over at each other's houses most weekends in fourth, fifth, and sixth grades, sometimes starting at Sarah's house on a Friday night and moving to Judy's on Saturday. Sarah can close her eyes and envision the elevator ride up or down from Judy's apartment, the way her mother always complained Sarah was different after a night at Judy's, less kind. Sarah felt it too, the way Judy persisted, the way the person Sarah was with Judy persisted, like an infection in her blood. It wasn't the lack of sleep Sarah knew that accounted for the difference. It was the abnegation, the utter surrender of her personality before Judy's, her willingness to accept Judy's jurisdiction, her desperation to please to be whomever Judy wanted, if Judy would just show her how. She probably wants to give you a birthday present, Sarah's mom says now, the relief in her voice as embarrassing as the silent pity Sarah has sensed all afternoon and into the evening. For years, Sarah will begrudge her mother this optimism, but now she is grateful. Sarah texts Judy that she'll be free in an hour. Judy is waiting in front of the movie theater, pretty in a flouncy pink miniskirt and tight white spaghetti strap tank top. Her legs and armpits are impeccably shaven. Sarah always feels large and lumpy beside Judy. Do you think you're fat, Judy asked once, and Sarah sensed no was the wrong answer. So she shrugged, uh, and Judy nodded sagely, saying, I don't, but most people do. She sucks in her stomach, tries to stand straight, but not too straight, tries to be half invisible and half promising, so that Judy can see in her whatever she wants, no less and no more. Sarah is wearing the trendiest top she has, a hand-me-down from her cousin, and jean shorts like those Judy used to wear. As soon as Judy looks her up and down, Sarah knows she's screwed up. She doesn't need Judy to tell her that no one wears jean shorts anymore. She can read this in Judy's disdain, but Judy tells her anyway. Sarah knows she will never wear these shorts again. Inside the movie theater, Judy buys a ticket and walks to the concession stand while Sarah buys hers. When Sarah joins her, Judy already has a soda and junior mints. She heads to the escalator. She picks the row. During previews, Judy does not lean over to Sarah to whisper which movies look good, which actors are hot, doesn't even quiz Sarah on which stars she can recognize. During the movie, she doesn't comment loudly like she used to. She doesn't incur the scowls that always mortified Sarah, but exhilarated her too. When the movie ends, Judy doesn't sit through the credits to see if the screen will gift them one final scene, doesn't wait in case the story isn't yet over. She says she should be going, and she goes. Sarah walks home and once home, keeps going. She walks circles around her block. It isn't the humiliation that bothers her or the fact that her mother will see her embarrassment or that Sarah can't read Judy anymore, can't conjure what her life must be such that texting Sarah could give her something she wanted but didn't have. Sarah pictures an even Judy or Judy out Judying Judy at school and Judy hurting, Judy needing Sarah to make Judy feel like Judy again. Sarah can accept this. She can give this to Judy. She hopes that she has. What bothers her as she turns left on Broadway 
is that as she turns left on Broadway, she can't feel the post-Judy smolder and crackle that her mother has always detested, the depressurization of return that meant she'd been someone else. Thank you so much.